Welcome to TSX Quarterly, the podcast that brings you publicly available earnings calls from companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange in one convenient location. Gone are the days of looking through confusing websites. You'll find the important information right here. Enjoy the call. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Osisco Gold Royalties Q3 2021 Results Conference Call. After the speaker's presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Please note that this call is being recorded today, November 10th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Today on the call, we have Mr. Sandeep Singh. President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. Frédéric Ruel, Chief Financial Officer and Vice President Finance. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your host for today's call, Mr. Sandeep Singh. Bonjour, Mesdames et Messieurs, et bienvenue à l'appel conférence des résultats du troisième trimestre de l'année 2021 de redevance horrifière au Cisco LT. Après la présentation, nous procéderons à une séance de questions et réponses. Si vous désirez poser une question, Veuillez appuyer sur la touche étoile suivie du numéro 1. Veuillez prendre note que cet appel est enregistré aujourd'hui, le 10 novembre 2021, à 10 heures heure de l'Est. Nous avons sur l'appel d'aujourd'hui M. Sandy Singh, président et chef de la direction, et M. Frédéric Ruel, chef de la direction financière et vice-président finance. J'aimerais maintenant céder la parole à votre hôte, M. Sandy Singh. Great. Thank you, operator. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us for an update on our Q3 financials, a really good quarter for us. Uh, I'm not getting tired of saying that. <laughs> so looking forward to update you on uh, our developments over the course of the last quarter and then looking forward. Uh, as we do, I'll point out that there is a presentation on our website. If you don't already have it, we'll be walking through that, uh, Fred and I, uh, pointing out slides as we go. So please make sure you pick up that presentation. And then starting on slide two, I'll also remind you that uh, we'll be making forward-looking statements as we give you this update. So please uh, please be mindful of that fact. Um, on slide three, just starting off with some highlights on the quarter. Uh, we earned, as you already know, given that we, we pre-released these numbers, just over 20,000 geos, gold equivalent ounces, for the quarter, which led to a record in terms of revenues. Uh, and cash flows um, of 50 million and 44 million, respectively, for the royalty and streaming segment of our company. Uh, the cash margin stayed uh, very similar, uh, 93% or 97%, excluding Renard, so no change in that high margin business. Um, and then <clears throat> on the net earning side, uh, 1.8 million Canadian, that's obviously as a result of the impairment on the Cisco development side of Bonanza Ledge 2. Um, uh, rem a reminder on that front that the purpose or one of the primary purposes of that uh, BL2 component, which is not the primary caribou asset, is for training. It's largely for the remediation of a pack pile that sits on surface, uh, and it's an area that can be worked while uh, to commission the mill while the larger project cannot be touched in the permitting process. So a bit of noise there, but, but uh, more, not more than that. Uh, adjusted earnings from the royalty segment of 23.3 million Canadian or 14 cents a share. As you know, uh, we increased our dividend uh, a quarter ago to five and a half cents um, and uh, paid that dividend on October 15th. We've also uh, reissued that dividend for the next quarter uh, in the same way. Uh, in terms of uh, some acquisitions, maybe I'll just jump around a little bit. Uh, apart from the dividend, we've also been more active on our NSIB over the course of the third quarter, buying back 1.7 million shares at an average price of 15. We've been saying this, that the, you know, the disconnect, if it gets too wide between our fundamental value and our share price, we would take advantage of it. And we did so more aggressively in Q3, and we'll look to find, uh, if, if we're given more opportunities, we'll, we'll take them in the future. In terms of uh, new investments we acquired, as you know, that 2.75% royalty on the TZ project in Brazil, which is now being pushed forward by G Mining uh, very aggressively. We'll talk about that. That does have a buy down, a right, which could take it down to 0.75%, which is how we uh, we thought about it. Um, and we also, uh, post the quarter, concluded a transaction to buy uh, a small portfolio of assets from Barrick <clears throat> with a flagship asset in that that's moving forward, a high-grade asset. 
uh, that I will uh, update you on just on the next page. So a productive quarter for us and a lot of good things happening throughout the portfolio that we'll talk about through the rest of this presentation. On slide four, I won't go through it because we already have on the TZ side. Uh, I think we, we talked about this last quarter as it was a subsequent event. Um, but generally, uh, you know, good progress from G-Mining. We're expecting a fees in the early part of 2021. Sorry, 2022, forgive me. Um, construction financing to be kind of sorted out in H1 with a construction decision expected in the second half of next year. So fast tracking. Uh, and we look forward to that news flow as well as expiration upside coming from uh, from that group. On the uh, the Barrick portfolio, the asset I was referring to uh, was a 2% royalty on the West Kenya project that's being operated by Shanta Gold. It's a very high-grade, very high IRR project uh, with a very capable operator in the region who has the capacity to build a mine, and this is a core part of their growth strategy. So. Um, we look forward to the level of emphasis that's going to be placed on this asset within Shanta. You'll notice there's some, some numbers there in terms of current expectations of a high-grade 105,000 ounce a year type mine for a long mine life. It also sits in a very prospective large land package, about 1,200 square kilometers, relatively untested, uh, with some of the best drill results coming out of it anywhere in the sector at this point. Uh, intervals including four meters of over 700 grams, six meters of over 200 grams a ton. So uh, that's uh, another kind of small single for us, but one that we think uh, could add a lot of value in the years to come. On slide five, we touched on it earlier in terms of our uh, returning capital to, to shareholders. We have a very strong uh, dividend yield of 1.4%. We've, we've returned capital to shareholders every day since the uh, existence of the company. Uh, and that NSIB uh, just upped it. You know, between the uh, the dividend and the NSIB this year, we've returned more capital to shareholders than anybody in our peer group, uh, if you put the two together. And that will remain a focus for us. That our high margin business allows us to do that, no matter what's happening in the uh, commodity cycle. Obviously, great day today, but irrespective of the gold price, uh, with a 97% cash margin business, this can be a, a go forward factor in our company. On slide six. You just see the production over the quarter by asset. Um, I'd say the producing asset base is performing extremely well. They're positive catalysts across the board, and we'll touch on some of them in the, the subsequent slides. Um, also worth pointing out on a day where, where gold is having a bit of a run that we provide, uh, gold and silver is, is by the highest uh, precious metal weighting in our peer group, we believe, or amongst the highest. Uh, at a point where we think gold has an opportunity to, to really outperform after being range bound, frankly, uh, either down or range bound for the last 12 months. Obviously, the CPI number out of the U.S. is not lost on anyone uh, today. I think it's important to point out that it's not only the overall CPI number high, the core number is also high, and, and I think the inflation story is broadening. And I think that rhetoric about it being transitory uh, for much of 2021 is starting to feel uh, more and more hollow. So. We think there's a good backdrop for gold. Amongst that backdrop, we're going to be you know, delivering more and more gold ounces at the right time, we believe. Move forward to, forgive me, it says slide seven for me again, uh, but the Canadian Arctic slide. <clears throat> uh, obviously, this is our flagship asset. It's a phenomenal flagship asset. Uh, on the operating side, it continues to do uh, extremely well. Uh, obviously, the catalyst that most people are watching for is the underground story to develop uh, in terms of the underground actual development work that's progressing ahead of schedule. Uh, the infill drilling routinely is returning wide, very high grade results for East Goldie uh, down to significant depths. Uh, the exploration or the extension work of East Goldie is also coming in extremely nicely, uh, promising widths and grades down to two kilometers of depth and out a kilometer and a half from the closest resource ounce. So a lot of potential for upside there. Uh, based on the disclosure from the operators, we expect a healthy uh, resource increase in early 2022 and look forward to that uh, to that news flow. Uh, apart from you know what I've already talked about, there's also uh, other components of potential growth. Uh, there's a portion called Odyssey Internal, which if you look at the bottom left here is kind of labeled as that porphyry, those porphyry rocks sitting between uh, Odyssey South and North. Uh, those have had, uh, you know, strong uh, intersections as well, early days, but that could contribute with more drilling. Overall, right now, I believe there are 15 rigs active 
It's been 95,000 meters drilled in the first three quarters. So we expect that uh, momentum to continue. And as it does, uh, really hasn't been any, anything, uh, any step backward on that story. It's only gotten better as the operators focus on it. So fantastic place to start. On slide eight, uh, with respect to two other significant assets at Mansos, uh, we've talked about this before. The, uh, the, you know, the, the, the debottlenecking project, if you will, the expansion project is nearly complete. Uh, they're giving us a 99% kind of pre-commissioning progress. <clears throat> The overall completion of that is still expected in the first quarter of next year, uh, at which point we start to see a ramp up in ounces there. Uh, expecting deliveries in the first full five years of uh, post-expansion to average 1.3 million ounces of silver. So a significant increase for us. Frankly, one of the better copper intermediate companies in the sector, uh, and we expect as uh, transparency increases on this asset, and as the ounces, frankly, start coming out of the assets, uh, people will start to appreciate this mine for what it is and our silver stream for what it means to us. <clears throat> uh, at the Eagle Mine in uh, for Victoria, that's really good news as well. Uh, great result, frankly, in terms of the ramp-up. It produced 50, almost 56,000 ounces uh, in the quarter, so a big step up versus Q2. So it's nice to see the ramp up going as well as it is. Obviously, they're they're still focusing on exploration, but we expect their that effort to ramp up as well. <laughs> Poor choice of words that 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 effort to accelerate as the ramp up starts to get to steady state, uh, and are keen to learn their plans to push the mine even further to a uh, 250,000 ounce a year type level in the near term. So excellent uh, update on that front. Uh, on the next slide, slide nine, just a couple others, and, and you know, we're touching on not all of our assets, but picking out some things that we think are salient. Uh, very happy to see Minera Alamo start to pour gold uh, or, or carbon to then pour gold off of. Um, it's a heap leach in Mexico where we have a 3% NSR. We expect that uh, the company to scale up operations as they go at full capacity for a full year. It's 1,000 geos for us. Um, it's a brand new asset. It will mark our 18th producing asset. asset and look forward to the success of that uh, that endeavor. On the CB side, our 3% royalty there has been an important one for us for a long time. Uh, nice to see the record level of, uh, of throughput there in September trending towards and, and expectations that they'll trend towards the higher end of their guidance. Uh, and then even more importantly, the expiration results that they've been talking up in the near term uh, look very promising. And we look forward to an update on that front in 2022 the gap hanging wall is kind of the next phase of, of production, and you'll notice there are a couple bullet points of intercepts uh, that bode extremely well. So positive results, not just on that ore body, but across all the ore bodies that make up the CB complex, um, and, uh, and look forward to more information on that uh, carrying into the next year. On slide 10, updates on the assets that are within a Cisco Development Corp, so Caribou and San Antonio. Um, Caribou, I think they, at the end of the quarter, they were up to 152,000 meters of drilling. Uh, that gives them enough information to put the pin in it and now work towards a resource, sorry, reserve update towards the end of the year, uh, or very early next, but that type of time frame and still tracking for a feasibility study in the first half of 2022. So those will be the, the major milestones there. In the interim, they've had good success from a permitting perspective, including getting a, an underground bulk sample permit at Cow Mountain, which is not necessarily easy to do when you're in the process of a broader permitting cycle. So that shows the strength, I believe, of the relationship that they have uh, with the regulators. Um, and so that's, uh, that's work that they can achieve in 2022, which will give them a head start in terms of information and just a head start on, uh, on the asset overall. Uh, so a big, large, large catalyst on that story uh, expected in 2022 along the same timeline that we've already talked about. San Antonio a uh, total of almost 23,000 meters have been drilled. Um, we expect, uh, you know, positive potential in, increases on both the oxide and the sulfide level of that story. Results should be expected shortly, so it'll be good, frankly, for us and, and everyone to see more visibility on that asset. We're looking forward to that event, um, and, uh, and we think as they continue to drill, the upside potential there, both in oxide and in sulfide, is quite high, so we look forward to that story taking shape. Uh, here in the very near term. In the meantime, they are putting the existing stockpile on uh, back on 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 leach with the new leach pads constructed and completed. 
Uh, and so we look forward to a small amount of production from that stockpile, which will be helpful to the overall uh, overall story. A couple of other development assets worth touching on today. <clears throat> First, Upper Beaver on slide 11 here. Um, you know, the drilling there being done by Ignico is continuing to prove out. There's been some very long uh, high-grade runs uh, in the infill program that they're doing and potentially expanding it as well. Uh, so, so we expect that. We frankly expect a pretty significant update overall in 2022 with respect to uh, drilling and resources, the feasibility, the plan, and the timeline overall for development. Um, just recently, a project description was submitted in September, which described a 10 to 15,000 ton per day operation with a 16-year mine life. So, pretty important asset. It's one where, if you go, go back to the commentary from Magnico, they've been talking about it for some time as being a mine, quote-unquote. The question has been timing and when do they phase it in. I think with the merger with Kirkland Lake, uh, you know, this is one of the areas that they've been talking up about potential synergies. Uh, so that has the potential to fast-track things, uh, not only for Upper Beaver, um, but also for, for other assets like AK, Amalgamated, Kirkland, where we have 2% royalty as well. There are 700,000 ounces there that are sitting within 300 meters of the underground development of Macassa. So those prior were probably, you know, obviously not a standalone asset, but can that come into to play for us? Uh, we certainly hope so, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing more about how that all fits together uh, over the course of next year. And then BAC40 is an asset uh, currently run by Aquila, which has gone through some permitting uh, hang hiccups. I think this is uh, maybe not the right word, but some permitting challenges. Um, we're happy to see kind of a revamped permitting process underway, one with a much smaller footprint, uh, smaller open pit, bigger underground, which should serve their permitting per, you know, process well. Uh, and, and frankly, also happy to see uh, Gold Resource Corp, a larger producing entity, come in and see the same thing that we do and Aquila does in terms of uh, the potential there. Um, so having a larger, better capitalized producer see that value in back 40 and the value in the work that the Aquila team has been doing is a positive step uh, and a really, really big step forward in terms of this uh, significant stream for us. So we look forward to that uh, transaction being completed, the permitting work coming out with a positive result, and then uh, hopefully this becoming a core part of uh, Gold Resources uh, growth strategy for their second asset. On slide uh, 12, this is a slide that we, we kind of show more routinely, so I won't go through it uh, uh, in detail, just our growth profile. Uh, a lot of organic growth on the come, I guess, is the uh, the summary of it. Uh, some of it hits in 2022 and 2023. There are other chunky assets that are moving forward more to the middle of the decade, um, but they're, they're generally assets that matter. These are important assets in the sector run by credible groups. Excuse me. Um, and uh, never as fast as you like, but they're on the come. Even our long-term assets are benefiting from significant catalysts and progress. So, you know, when you look at this page, I think we've got a decade of growth in front of us that's in, in strong shape, um, and uh, look forward to uh, to seeing that develop over the years. So, I'll pause there and, and hand it off to Fred, uh, who will give you a little bit more color on the actual financials, uh, and then I'll uh, be back to wrap it up and for the Q and A. Thank you, Sadiq. Uh, bonjour et merci de vous joindre à nous ce matin pour la présentation de nos résultats du troisième trimestre. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Q3 was not too different from Q2. New records were reached with strong deliveries of gold and silver, which led again to record revenues and operating cash flows from our royalties and streams business. Uh, if we go to page 13 of the presentation, we recorded record revenues of 50 million compared to 41.2 million, million in Q3 of 2020, which was, of course, impacted by the COVID pandemic. We also had offtake revenues in 2020, which is not the case in Q3 of this year, as our last producing offtake was converted into a stream last April. Cash flows from operating activities were 41.1 million on a consolidated basis for the royalties and stream segment alone. Cash flows from operations reached a record 44.1 million compared to 37.3 million in Q3 of last year. If we go on page 14, we present a summary of our earnings and adjusted earnings. 
consolidated net earnings to assist co shareholders was 1.8 million or, or 1 cents per share compared to 12.5 million in 2020 or 8 cents per share. The lower net earnings, as mentioned by Sandy, was due to the impairment charges recorded by a Cisco development of 33.3 million. On a consolidated basis, adjusted earnings were 17.9 million, 11 cents per share which includes adjusted earnings of 23.3 million or 14 cents per share from the royalties and stream segment and an adjusted loss of 5.4 million from a Cisco development or 3 cents per share. On page 15, we have a summary of our quarterly results with additional details for the royalties and stream segment, which includes a gross profit of 33.8 million compared to 30.8 million last year. And as uh, we have previously mentioned, operating cash flows of 44.1 million were generated in Q3 by uh, our royalty and stream business for a total year to date of 118 million. On page 16, we have a breakdown of our cash margin for Q3 and the first nine months of 2021. In Q3 of this year, the cash margin on our royalties reached 34.4 million. The cash margin on our streams amounted to 12.1 million for a total of 46.5 million. This brings the total cash margin for the first nine months of the year to 140 million. And on page 17, uh, we, you'll find a summary of our financial position. Our consolidated cash balance was 152 million at the end of Q3, uh, including 80 million for Cisco Go royalties and 72 million for a Cisco development. A Cisco Go royalties held investments having a value of 169 million at the end of September, in addition to our investment in a Cisco development valued at over 500 million. Our debt was stable at 405 million with over 535 million available under the credit facility, which as you know was increased and extended last July. We have also acquired 1.7 million shares under our NCIB program for 26 million in Q3 for a total of 2.1 million in 2021 or 30.5 million. In summary, we had record revenues and operating cash flows in Q3 as a result of strong deliveries and gold prices. And with the increase in gold prices and silver prices this morning for where following increased inflation in the U.S., we can only be optimistic for Q4 as well. I will now turn the call back to Cindy for closing remarks and questions. Thanks, Fred. And uh, we will open it up for Q&A here any second. Um, just been brought to my attention that perhaps there was a delay of about 10 minutes for some people entering the call. So, our apologies for that. Um, hopefully, we we can make it up uh, in the Q and A if we need to. But rest assured, uh, I said some great things in those first ten minutes, uh, <laughs> better than what you probably heard. Uh, but but it is a simple quarter for us again, and and the, the operations are, are are working extremely well. So apologies for that uh, that technical glitch. Uh, hopefully, uh, it won't happen again in future. But uh, operator, with that, I think we can open it up for uh, for Q and A. Thank you. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the training roster. Your first question comes from jo Josh Wolf, son from RBC Capital Market. Please go ahead. Does everyone need customer support today? We've got you. Intercom has the tools to manage support at any scale, like integrations, bots, and more. All in one powerful platform. We'll even automatically resolve 33% of your support volume, so you have more time for customers who need you most. Oh, that's better. Supercharge your team's productivity and make your customers super happy with Intercom. Learn more at intercom.com slash support. At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently, so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan, so you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device acquired. Coverage not available in some areas. Some uses may require certain plan or features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Hi, Josh, can you hear us?
Josh, your line is now open. Sorry about that. That was an issue on my end. Um, with the with the permitting scheduling, uh, you know, outlined in the uh, in in the release for Sapucci at San Antonio, um, what should we expect in terms of timeframes for? Uh, I guess initial kind of real mining and, and, and heat bleach processing from that deposit and then overall, you know, how does, how does permitting look there and then scheduling for, for production? Yeah. Good morning, Josh. Uh, I think things look frankly quite well. We've always been a little bit worried that with COVID, we might see undue delays. Uh, Cisco development might see undue delays there in, in Mexico. So far, so good. Uh, so fingers crossed that that continues and there's no kind of you know, bureaucratic delays. Um, important to see that the the stockpile is you know got 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 permitted and is uh, is nearly complete. So that work is ongoing. So there will be a little bit of production. But in terms of the main production that you're referring to from Sipucci, you know, the hope is that uh, that permit can come in. We're saying first half, but the expectation is hopefully early uh, early part of next year. And then that's the gating item. Once that comes into play, um, you know, if it does come into play in that time horizon, then we can expect. Uh, production uh, in 2022. Obviously, if if it comes in earlier, hopefully we can get a little bit more in. But that's the the kind of bounds that we're we're working with. So it'll be a little bit uncertain until the the permit comes in, and hopefully that uh, once it does, it'll be a little bit more clarity on how much of a year we can catch in 2022. And if we don't catch, uh, you know, the year we're expecting in 2022, frankly, it just flows into 23. But overall, I think we're happy with the progress there. Happy with the uh, exploration drilling that we're seeing will be nice to get an update out there for everybody. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, as far as mining goes, I think it's all pretty, pretty near term. Okay. So it, it sounds like, um, that, that would imply, you know, if you get the Sapucci permit in the first half of the year, you can get production that would imply, you know, let's say within a six month time frame from permitting receipts, you'd be able to, to generate production. Is that fair to say? Yeah, look, if it's the very end, the very last day of the first half, I think that's uh, that's optimistic. But I think we're 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 casting a pretty wide net when we say the first half of the year. So we'll see how that uh, how that evolves, and hopefully it can be sooner or later, and we'll have uh, we'll have visibility on that. I think as we sit here on November 10th, it's it's not that far away in terms of getting better visibility on the timing. Okay, and then for Mantos. Um, so if commissioning is happening in the fourth quarter, um, you know, should we expect maybe lower production in the near term as, as uh, you know, maybe there's some operating interruptions um, before some improvements next year? And then uh, can you remind me what, you know, the typical delay is between uh, production at the site and, and when, you know, Osisco receives that output in terms of revenues? I'll ask. Uh, I don't have that second answer for you off the top of my fingertips, Fred. Uh, while I answer the first, maybe you want to give that some thought. But I think overall, we don't in our conversations with the team over at Mentos expect the final uh, kind of tie-in, if you will, to to cause much of a, uh, a back step in terms of production. That's not the that's not what we've been told to date. And as you can imagine, it's a big project. It's not like it, it happens. It's not like flipping on a switch. They've been doing it as we speak. You know, as they're 99% complete on pre-commissioning, obviously certain things are already kind of coming into the fold. So, um, you know, time will tell, and it'll happen pretty quickly. But so far, uh, we do not expect, uh, you know, there to be a step backwards. Same token, you know, is it going to – it's not It's not a light switch to the positive either, so it'll take a little bit of time to ramp up. Uh, so we're not expecting to get the full benefit of, uh, of the year in terms of maybe being at 1.3 million ounces, but hopefully – better than we are and, and somewhere significantly towards that mark. So that's how we, we think about uh, Mantos and try to putting it on the spot. If we don't have an answer, we can get back to you with one, Josh. But do you have a sense, Fred, in terms of the, the timing delays on, on Mantos answers? Yeah, usually I would say it's uh, one to two months. Uh, it's not more than two months. Okay, that's great. And then maybe Perfect. one final question, just on the uh, on the capital allocation side. Um, you know, the company has been pretty active on its buyback and, and most of the acquisitions in terms of, um, you know, royalties and streams have been smaller dollar amounts. Um, you know, and, and there is a, a, a reasonable size debt position, but there is obviously a lot of financial flexibility. You know, how do you see the company balancing 
these different elements and, and perhaps what's the company's appetite to, to transact the streams versus buying back stock at, at, uh, at current prices? Look, I think the, you said you used the, word, the right word. It's balance. Uh, you know, we, we feel like we have the financial, financial flexibility to do all of that. Obviously, you know, if we see the right deals, we can reach for them. We have a lot of room on our credit facility. We upped it intentionally. We, we increased the facility, reduced the cost of it. That provides us kind of a backstop for the, the convert that comes due at the end of next year. Uh, you know, but when, you know, I, I said in early 2022 that we would be disciplined at, at a point in the cycle where, you know, there were a lot more options for the sector in terms of how to finance itself. And, and we were, and we have been, and we will continue to be. So, uh, you know, we don't have to chase growth the same way as others. Perhaps we have a lot of it internally. We're still active, uh, looking at things and, and we've still been able to add good quality assets along the way without overpaying for them. You know, assets that don't need spot prices to be viable. So, um, you know, where we sit today, though, I would say, you know, with commodities, most commodities, or sorry, certain commodities having been flattened down with the equity markets a lot more, uh, you know, discerning, if you will, I think there's a greater need for, for royalty and streaming capital. So if we can find the right assets that fit our, uh, our objectives, we are happy to, to transact in bigger and bigger sums. But, um, that's how we're, we're managing it. You know, uh, balance when the when the stock just gets ridiculous and cheap, we'll step in. I think we can do a little bit of all of it, uh, frankly, and and uh, we'll, we'll keep reassessing that balance as it changes. You can imagine it's a pretty fluid situation. If you see something really big that you want to do, obviously that changes things. But for now, we're pretty comfortable that we have the ability to to do uh, everything we need to with our balance sheet. Great. Those are all my questions. Thank you. No problem, Josh. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from Carrie Smith from Haywood Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks, operator. Sandy, and just for Mantos, just to follow up on Josh's question, would it be reasonable then to assume the full year 2023 would be at the 1.3 million ounce rate on the silver deliveries then? Would that be what you're kind of expecting, I guess, on the ramp up. Did, did you say 2023, Kerry? Yeah, yes. Like a full, like basically nine months or 10 months to ramp it up through 2022 and then a full full run rate in 2023 calendar year. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. Obviously, a lot can happen between now and then, but it's been a, a fantastic performer for us. I think, you know, the expectation is, frankly, hopefully we can have a long way towards that mark, even in 2022. I think it's just, you know, be premature for me to say until they get the, uh, they get the system kind of booted up. Um, but certainly we, we, you know, been impressed with the operational capability of that group. Uh, they hit it out of the park every chance they get. So, uh, I think, you know, getting ahead of myself, but certainly we're expecting a significantly increased year in 2022. And hopefully with that behind them, they'll, uh, they'll be uh, humming in 23. And, and on back 40, are you anticipating that the Gold Resource Corp will update that feasibility study looking at, they're, they're talking about a smaller footprint. I presume they're going to have to update the feasibility to look at a smaller footprint and a bigger underground operation. But do you know what their plans are? Yes. So yes, yes to all, Kerry. That, that is the, the path. Um, you know, there was a new feasibility in the works with uh, Aquila on a standalone basis. Uh, our technical team was providing some oversight to that process. Um, you know, we've been out the view for some time that smaller open pit and a bigger underground there makes more financial sense, frankly, and certainly helps on the permitting side, uh, potentially not needing, you know, not impacting the wetlands that were the issue back last time around at all. So uh, we think that makes sense uh, in every way, and we're happy to see Gold Resource, Alan Palmier and his team there step in and see it the same way as we all do. So. They're essentially picking up that feasibility in progress, intend to complete it, obviously, uh, and then use that as the backdrop to uh, to go back through the permitting cycle. Hopefully, a cycle that will be shorter this time around is what we're we're told. Uh, but uh, that's that's the gating item there. Uh, but I think there is a really good project there, and it's one that uh, they're eager to push forward. And so, are you thinking the feasibility, or are you expecting the feasibility would be complete by the end of next year, then, or earlier than that? 
Uh, you're testing my uh, my recall now, Carrie, but I think the answer is is earlier than that. Uh, it's something that was was underway, uh, you know, as soon as kind of the, the permitting hit a snag this year. Frankly, uh, a lot of the work and the thinking had already been done by the the team there. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect it to take all next year. I just don't off the top of my head remember the exact timeline, but it's uh, I have to guess. I think we're thinking kind of certainly kind of middle of the year, if not maybe even sooner. Okay, because I, would I be correct in, in my recollection that they need that updated feasibility before they can go back into the permitting cycle, though, correct? Yeah, look, I think that's absolutely fair. I mean, if you're going back to the permitting cycle, you need to kind of show them what the difference, um, the, the new project looks like. So that's why I think that the timeline for that feasibility is actually quite a bit sooner, but I just don't have it at my fingertips right this second. But, yes, okay. they, they will need that fees to go back through the permitting cycle. Okay, gotcha. And then just last question quickly on, on Renard, you know, based on the quarterly average carrot values that you're realizing there that they're realizing, it would seem that that operation is uh, is looking significantly better. And I'm just wondering when you're going to bring it back in and start receiving your GEOs from, from that operation. Yeah, look, things are going well there from a diamond price perspective. We didn't put it in the, the press release, so if you, if you didn't, uh, catch it in the MDNA. Uh, the last sale, I believe, was 104 US and change. Uh, frankly, for a smaller set of diamonds, uh, not of good quality, so pretty darn good result. Um, the company is building up some cash, uh, has been for a little while, so that's all positive. You know, it's, uh, Renard is something we've been working to get back, you know, to get value back on uh, for some time. Um, currently, as you point out, I think or as you allude to, we're, we're redistributing our stream proceeds back until April of next year. Um, so that's something we spend time on, Gary, absolutely, and, and we'll come back to you in the market when we have a better uh, better solution there for us. But I, as I said, you know, really positive result. Things are looking better there than uh, than we'd expected, um, and uh, we'll you know. But the purpose of us kind of uh, sticking around and, 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 and that private co was to get back to our stream value and that's our uh, our objective. Okay, but that you're going to stick to the April 2022 timetable of just to keep reinvesting the cash, so I guess. Not 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 necessarily. It's just that's the mark that's there right now um, and uh, having those discussions all the time, really. Okay. And, but obviously that you know, the, every, every sale has continued to bolster the Treasury, and uh, so we're, we're having those discussions all the time. Right. Okay. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Kerry. And your next question comes from Russ Carden from Polygon. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, guys. Um, yeah, just one from me. On the diamond price, I saw the commentary in the MDNA. Is that more quality-driven or, or market-driven? Because it looked like a pretty healthy increase. And I'm just trying to put it in context of what we see from other diamond producers, which have seen kind of small up, where this looks like a pretty big jump. So I know it's a bit off the run, but um, I wonder if you have any color on that. Yeah, hi, Ross. Um, it's, you know, the quality, in fact, you know, the quality of, of Renard diamonds hasn't markedly changed. In fact, if anything, in that last sale, as I pointed out, maybe not well, uh, it, it was a worse set, a worse batch, if you will. Um, so it was nice to see the uplift, uh, even with that, uh, that, that, uh, that backdrop. So I think it is really uh, a market impact in that scale of, of diamonds and that, in that, uh, band of, of diamond quality and sizes. Um, I think now we have formally seen the last of the Argyle batches hit, which is a set of diamonds, uh, that, that's very comparable. So I think, I think there's a bit of that, you know, production has stopped, but I think, you know, uh, I think we're seeing the last batches kind of hit that. So promising uh, that uh, that market is strengthening the way it is. Yeah, no, that is uh, interesting. Okay, thank you. That was it. No problem, Ross. And there are no further questions at this time. I will turn the call back over to the presenters for closing remarks. Thank you, operator, and thanks, uh, everyone, for, for taking the time. Again, our apologies uh, if you missed out on the front bit. If there are any kind of further burning questions, you can reach out to us uh, anytime. We're very proud of uh, the status of the company right now, proud of the quarter, proud of the asset base. Happy to talk to you about it uh, at any point in time. 
Um, and with that, uh, maybe just one small uh, note, obviously tomorrow around this time, Remembrance Day. Uh, so on behalf of our whole team and obviously everyone listening, I'm sure we thank those who have uh, fought and those who continue to fight to defend our way of life. Um, it's easy to get kind of bogged down into your own issues, but hopefully tomorrow during that moment of silence, people take a second to uh, to focus on the bigger picture. So stay healthy, uh, be well, and enjoy the positive uh, gold day. Thank you, everyone. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. At T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan, so you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal Awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device required. Coverage not available in some areas. Some users may require certain plan or features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee's fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Find a store near you at speedway.com slash locations. Thank you for listening to TSX Quarterly. If you enjoyed the cast, remember to leave a good rating. And remember, for any additional inquiries, please consult the company's investor relations section on their website. See you next time.